So, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, I'm uh, Pierre Chibon, also known as Pingu. And Neil and I are going to introduce you a little bit about uh, the Pagur project. Um, so, what's on the agenda? Basically, we'll start about what Pagur is. Uh, we go back a little bit through the history of uh, how it came to be. Uh, I'll present you a little bit further what uh, the state is currently in and some of the features it has. Uh, I'll speak quickly about the ecosystems and some of the applications you can find around Pagur. Um, some of the ideas we have for the future. And then uh, Neil will take over for uh, tempting Murphy and see if we can actually get a live demo to work on stage here. Um, so to the start, what Pagur is? Um, so it's a very hard word to pronounce for non-French people. Um, you can ask Neil, he has uh, problems with it. Yeah, Pagur is a hard word to say. Um, so it's the French word that refers to the Latin word pagurus, which is, the, which is a family of seashells, uh, of which the most well-known is the Pagurus bernardus, which is otherwise known as the hermit crab. And some of the picture you can see in there. It's, it seems uh, to be anecdotal from this, uh, but I'm actually going to come back on this in a little bit later, because there is a little bit of a meaning behind this, uh, using this name. So, for the purpose of this talk, Pagur is going to refer to a lightweight, geek-centric, Python-based, full project hosting forge, which also happens to be, you know, GPL v2 or later versions. How does it come to be? Well, it started in the federal project, and more precisely uh, because of the release engineering team. So the release engineering team in Fedora uh, used to work in a, in a close proximity to each other, but also a little bit of a hard-to-reach team in, in, uh, in Fedora. You could, it was hard to collaborate with them. It was hard to reach out, to figure out what they were working on, how they were working on them, and see where you could poke at things to help them. Um, so they, wanted, they were self-conscious of that, and they wanted to improve, to improve that situation. So they wanted to open up the collaboration to get more of the, the people in the federal community to help with release engineering. At that time, we have Pagur, which was then called Progit, as a proof of concept of the site, something which I had worked on the, on the site to see. Um, basically, I was looking at the interaction between Python and Git then. Um, so why Pagur? Well, GitHub is the, the, the default uh, nowadays platform for building open source software or for building software in general. The main issue is, well, if you look at the licensing, uh, you're probably all aware of that, but GitHub is not a free and open source software. Uh, so for release engineering in Fedora, they, really, they were really attached to the, to the notion of using only free and open source software to build Fedora. So GitHub was out of the picture. Uh, then we have uh, a number of com competitors. We have fabricators, we have Garrett, uh, but those are actually mainly about code review systems. Um, they are, uh, I, I spoke about with the one of the Fabricator developer back then, and uh, there was ideas about including an issue tracker in Fabricator, but it was something down the line and not a priority for a project. It wasn't what the project was meant to for. And for GitLab, uh, one of the requirements we had then was that everything in Fedora infrastructure had to be deployed from an RPM. And getting GitLab package was, has been a multi-year tentative, which has never succeeded. We've never been able to actually get GitLab package in Fedora, despite having several people working several years on this effort. And there is a second component to the GitLab. Is, um, I don't know if many of you have been actually trying to maintain GitLab. Um, but I will let Neil mention some words about that. So GitLab is great when you're using it as a user, and it has a lot of powerful functionality. But on the flip side, when you're administering that server, your life is kind of hell. Uh, they, the, the options tend to change quite a bit. The way that it actually handles its upgrades is rickety as best. and. Every, it's always a new surprise what breaks in a, in a GitLab upgrade. Like, there was, a, 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 for one of the pla for where I have maintained a GitLab server for going on a couple of years now, uh, there was a, an entire release series, like three or four releases in a row, where merge requests did not work because loading a merge request would cause it to spike up 
the browser would be overloaded, there would be so much JavaScript, it would all fall over and you couldn't actually do anything. That sort of defeats the point of something that kind of emphasizes a merge request style or pull request style workflow. So it was uh, not fun. So we've already considered the Rails engineering team in Fedora decided, well, you know, let's give Pagger a try and see how we can bring it forward. This has impacted also another team in Fedora, which is the, the infrastructure team itself. Uh, back then, we were running something called FedoraHosted.org, and it was a place for projects where Fedora or Fedora contributors was, were upstream. Um, so, you know, just a place where you could use your code. Uh, remember that Fedora Hosted basically started a little bit before GitHub, uh, or at least before GitHub became uh, what it is today. Uh, to the point that we actually were using track uh, 0.12. I forgot yeah. to yeah. fix that version. So we were still using 0.12 even after the 1.0 release was, uh, was released and out. Um, we were running different instances of track uh, for each project. It wasn't self-service. So basically, if you wanted to create a new project in the Fedora ecosystem using the fedora.hosted.org domain, you would have to open a ticket to, an infrastructure, to the infrastructure folks. One of them would wake up, see the ticket, process it, create the corresponding Git or SVN or Mercurial and Bazaar. I don't think we did. We have CVS back then, but we were offering uh, all of these options and, and set up the track for you. So you know, it could take between uh, a few hours to a few days before you, actually, you were actually able to publish your code. The other uh, place where we store code in Fedora uh, is the, the this Git repo. So it's the place where we have a Git repository for every package we ship in Fedora. The thing is, for a while, there was no collaboration model on this Git. Uh, if you wanted to contribute to a patch to a spec file, the best way to do that was, you know, go to Bugzilla, open a ticket, and attach your spec file in there. And I'm sure we all love reviewing patches on Bugzilla tickets. So this, come to, this has come to, to what Pagger is today. So to give you some dates, uh, the first commit on the project is from March uh, 2014. Uh, so a little bit more than five years ago. The Pagger.io itself was uh, released on May uh, 2015, so a little bit more than a year after that. Fedora Seed was sunset in 2017. Uh, Source.fedoraproject.org was launched on February 2017. Uh, so that, that this is our Diskit instance. Oh, sorry, on August 2017, that's our Diskit instance. And CentOS has recently also deployed Pagger on the top of the Diskit uh, last April. How does it look from a usage point of view? Uh, well, Pagger.io has about uh, 1,600 projects today from about 700 users and 140 groups. Uh, needless to say that the number of projects that we have on Pagoda.io is vastly greater than what we ever had on federalisty.org. Just the fact that you just can self-service has tremendously helped in there. Um, so if you're wondering how, how Pagoda scales, uh, on Fedora we are running an instance that has about 30,000 projects, that's how this gets, uh, you know, almost 3,000 users. Uh, CentOS just started and they only have 7,000 projects so far. And uh, on, on the scale ID, uh, I'm aware of one Pagger instance that is running with close to 45,000 projects. So it does scale to some extent. So what does it do? Well, it's a, it's a forge, you know, nothing new in there. We, are, uh, we have a place where you can host your code. Uh, where you can place your documentation, where you can have an issue tracker, report bugs, report uh, RFEs, and it provides the, the now de facto standard uh, fork and pull request or merge request workflow. Uh, one of the some of the features it has, it's it designed to not be uh, platform locking. So uh, each project is actually composed of four Git repositories. One is the main one you interact with, the one that you're the most used to, which hosts your code. The second one hosts your documentation. The documentation can be text files, HTML, Markdown, REST. The Markdown and the REST file will be converted to HTML on the fly. And then we have another two Git repos, one that contains all the ticket metadata and one that contains all the pull request metadata. So if you want to move out of Git, of uh, Pagur, you can download these, two, these four Git repos and you have everything that is in the database for Pagur for the, your project. It also comes back to 
the, the Pagur instance, the Pagur uh, animal on, on the side there. Because one of the original ideas was that you would be able to move a project from a Pagur instance to another one. And that's actually also how we migrated our project from federalist.org to Pagur.io. We dumped the content from track, formatted it in the way that Pagur expected it, enabled the hook on the, the ticket and the pull request tracker, git pushed, and everything appeared on the Pagur side. So one of the original idea behind this was also that you would be able to have a, a private internal Pagur instance and a public external Pagur instance, and you would be able to sync issues from one to the other, or pull requests from one to the other. Um, we also provide mirroring, mirroring to Pagur or mirroring from Pagur. So if you look at Pagur, we basically you know, eat our do own dog food, so Pagur.io slash Pagur is the original project. But Pagur is also present on GitHub and on GitLab.org. Uh, we have a third-party plugin mechanisms, and we're starting to make use of this on uh, the disk instance of Pagur in Fedora, so that we, we, prevents, uh, we are able to prevent new APIs new endpoints that, that allows us to expand the use of Pagur without, um, you know, without putting in the upstream code uh, um, endpoints uh, logic that is specific to a disk-git deployment. Uh, so something we worked on uh, recently. In Fedora, you have a, a point of contact. You have a, a main a principal maintainer for every package. And sometimes that person goes, out, goes away. And then the package is orphaned. Uh, for a while, people, people are able to unorphan the package, just make it their own. So we have a, a mechanism using this, we are able to say, well, if the package is orphan and that person is a packager, they are able to take the, to take the, the project from this orphan user. Uh, we have an extensible Git hook system. So if you want to write your own Git, Git hooks, if you want to make it uh, available on all, all the projects on your for or uh, something that is optional, it's easy to do. We have uh, teams. Uh, so we have four teams by default. Uh, I'm going to quickly go through three of them. Um, this is the Pagur.io the Pagur one. Uh, very, very simple. We have a very similar one for uh, the diskit instance. This is it. Um, that reminds me of the, the, the presentation we had yesterday about using similar sim uh, across uh, applications. Uh, this is the git.centos.org, and this is the closest one to the default. They basically only change the logo on the top here. Uh, and for the fourth team, I'm actually leaving the surprise for a little bit later. Uh, some of the other things it does. So how does it check SSH access? How does it check who can access which repos? Well, originally our disk git instance was using Gitalite. So we built Pagur on the top of Gitalite, and to some extent you could consider Pagur to be uh, some sort of self-service admin interface of Gitalite. Uh, but we recently also get rid of it because it has given us a little bit of problems uh, when you have 30,000 repositories and you refresh the Gitalite configuration file and you need to recompile it every time you're adding a new contributor to a project or adding a new project. It can take a little bit, a bit, a little bit of time. Uh, so we have also figured, we have also now ePagur itself a ways of deploying it without Gitalite. And some of the things which is also nice, you can just reply to a comment, uh, you know, whether it's from a pull request or from an, uh, from an issue by email and it will show up in the, in the database and in the UI. We have also a number of uh, notification systems. Uh, the classic webhooks that now everybody uses, but we also support a number of message bus. Um, so we have FedMessage, uh, which is which started to be the Fedora message bus and then got into got renamed to Federated Message Bus, uh, which is RMQ based. So it's a very much a fire and forget system. Uh, we're moving from FedMessage to Fedora messaging in the Fedora infrastructure, which is MQP based. Uh, but we also support Stomp and MQTT notifications. Uh, so to give you an idea, um, Fedora is using the top two. Uh, I know about one instance that's, that's using the third one, and the, Git, uh, the CentOS folks are using the MQTT one. On the community side, we have uh, 146 contributors. Uh, it seems to be not so much. I mean, you know, when you look at bigger projects. On the other side, from the infrastructure uh, point of view, this is definitely the project that has had the largest number of contributors. Uh, there used to be 40% of the contributors in the top 10 that was not Red Hat employee, except that we are one of them, so it's only the top three out of the 
top 10 contributors is only three that are non-readers today. Um, and for, we have, uh, I've listed here the three public instances which I've already mentioned, but we are aware about a few private instances as well. Uh, one of them, I'm not going to uh, reveal any secret here, is run internally at Red Hat. Others are run in different companies. So when it comes to the, the ecosystems, a little bit around Pagger. Um, we have, so the, the, with the principle that you can have uh, the issue metadata present in a Git repo that you can clone, there is a small utility which is called Pag Off, which basically lets you interact with your issue tracker offline. I use this all the time. When I'm traveling, when you're on a plane, when you're on a, you're on a train, you can just do something like Pag Off list Pagger, and it will go to, the, to your uh, local clone of your Pagger tickets and give you all the tickets that are open. You can assign them to yourself, you can close them, you can comment on them, you can, do, you can do anything offline. And when you reach network again, you just do a git pull, git push. If you have enabled the right hook on the, in the UI, your ticket is up to date. I, I find this very, very handy. Uh, we have a small Python library that interacts with the Pagger API. It's not feature complete. It's something that was started by the by contributors in the Pagger uh, in the Pagger project. Uh, so it's not feature complete. It does not cover the entire API, but it gives a base where people can collaborate if they if they need to or if they want to expand uh, and interact with Pagger. Come on, and, uh, you know, in a in a project. Um, the third one, which I'm going to speak about, is called Repo Spanner. It's something which is fairly new. Uh, we, are we are currently running it and rolling it in production. Uh, it's a distributed Git storage server. So it's one of the issues of Pagur is that it needs direct access to the Git repo, which means that you can't really do load balancing unless you actually use something like NFS, and then you run into it's doable. I know an instance that of Pagur that is running with the Git repos on NFS. It also can be a pain uh, to deal with every once in a while. So Repo Spanner partly solves that because you basically create a clusters of Repo Spanner nodes, and it's, it mimics a little bit what GitHub uses in production. So every time you push something, uh, it will sync your push to the nodes, and it needs the majority of the node to hack the change before it allows the push to go through. If the majority of the nodes is unavailable or not able to hack your push, it will deny the push, and you will have to retry it later on. It also means that you know, if you have an, a, a, a cluster of three and two have accepted the, the, the push, then the third one is going to catch up later on. It's very powerful. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's complex, but it's, uh, it's very powerful, and it's, uh, it's quite a nice piece of software. Uh, so that's what it is uh, today and what you can find around it. And the uh, ideas for the future, so it, it, this used to be roadmap, but I feared that uh, using the terminology roadmap here meant a little bit more uh, this is going to happen, while these are more uh, foggy ideas of things we could do. I don't know if we will go to there. Um, one of the ideas is actually to do a tighter integ integration with RepoSpanner. Currently, RepoSpanner is entirely optional. Uh, moving to it would actually sp allow speeding up a number of operations in Pagur. Um, Pagur relies on PyGit2, which itself is a Python binding to the libgit libraries, which has a number of issues. Um, one of them, for example, is doing a cloning a Git repo le leads, leaks file descriptors. So if you have a lot of clone running at the same time, you end up with too many files open exceptions. Um, to the point that I was receiving tens of emails a day about this problem, and I have actually replaced the libgit2 or pygit2 repository, repository clone by a, simple, by a simple subprocess git clone. I'm very happy about that, but that actually uh, was a better fix than, uh, than keeping on, uh, on what it is today. Um, so moving to RepoSpanner would actually, moving more operation to RepoSpanner, making it not optional, would actually allow us to, to farm out some of the Git operation to RepoSpanner, which is what it means to do. Um, improving the content of the webhooks and the notification, so that's something that Neil has reported. Uh, basically, apparently, the payload that we're sending on webhook and message post notification is not enough for everyone to act upon. Uh, so we need to identify what content is missing from these notifications and you know, add it in there. Uh, we would very much like to be able to figure out a way of having a CI system integrating on Pagure and to make it as easy as you know, opting in into Travis CI. So it's probably going to be something like you have a checkbox in the settings and a YAML file to do in the source, and it would automatically run the CI, 
triggers it on pull requests, on commits, and lets you know how it went. Um, one of the ideas which I have on the back of my head is the, the pull request dependencies. So if you work on different features at the same time, you're probably using different branch for each feature. And potentially, a feature is going to depend on another one. Or just because you want to merge feature A and then B and then C, even if they are independent from each other, if you keep opening them all against master, uh, it's great, except that your CI system is going to compare what is feature A against master, what is feature B against master, what is feature C against master. And every time you want to you merge one of them, you need to rebase the other two to be able to see, okay, what is the CI system now saying with A merge and B and C. And so if you're able to say, well, I want to merge A first and then B and then C, then we, 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 will, we would be able to, to show you the pull request of C against B, B against A, A against master. And your CI system would be able to say, well, I'm running A against master. I'm running B against A and C against B. And well, you know, if you change the order, you just change the dependency order. And I would make reviewing easier because you would not, because of chain pro, you would see the diff only of feature C against feature B and not A, B, uh, and C against master. And you would also have, uh, when the CI system runs and you can go through the code and there is nothing to change, you can just you know, merge A, B, and C in one go and you know your, C your CI system has already tested A, B, C, merge together. Um, one thing which we also have is the, the ability of creating a pull request from an email. So basically sending a diff or a patch to a certain address that would open a pull request to, the, to that project. Um, so again, these are not necessarily things that will be done or will be done in time soon, but these are things that are on the back of our mind and that we would very much like uh, to do. Or, you know, if anyone in the assembly would like to work on any of these tasks, we would very much <laughs> like to, to help you on, uh, get, get this uh, merged in. And with this, uh, I will let uh, Lee see if he can actually master Murphy for this afternoon. <laughs> so. Let's see if this second time around this is. And this time we're going to do a thing where I move this over here. So this is a virtual machine running OpenSUSE uh, Leap on it. And I have this running on here. So this is a Packer instance running the surprise theme, which is actually contributed by uh, Stasiak uh, for, for Packer a while ago when we did the 5.0 release. It's based on the theme that came from software at OpenSUSE.org. So it's, uh, it's the chameleon theme as it's called officially the tree. And I pulled in a couple of projects in here to kind of show off what it looks like. So this one's the RPM config SUSE project, which was, I mirrored this actually from GitHub earlier this morning and pulled that in into here. And you can see like there are the changes that went in from these people. Uh, if I do this one here, you can see the diff, the commits. You can even see all the references. Hyperlinks are clickable, and that will go to the place of the GitHub's um, other branches. The original version of RPM config SUSE that I wrote is there. Um, yeah, and the other one I pulled in was something that kind of looks somewhat like what we have in Fedora with Diskit, where I pulled in the, uh, the salt packaging repo that's on, op on the OpenSUSE GitHub org. Uh, and in here, like, you can see there's the patches in here. You can see that the diffs are actually like highlighted correctly. Uh, and then if we go to a spec file here, the spec file syntax highlighting, totally correct, has the comments, descriptions, and whatnot. Um, and then let's uh, see all the crazy branches for all the different versions and all the crazy things that have been going on in here. Uh, no tags, releases. So a little bit in here. Let's, oh, that's the wrong terminal. Um, hold it. Thank you. That makes that easier. And I'm going to switch this to mirroring because this is very, very hard. Don't use a separate mirror. Uh, and there we go. Now, uh, from in here, let's go into salt. And I'm going to do 
Uh, so, yeah, let's put some bigger fonts in. Whoa, not the right one. This one. All right, so in salt here, we've got all of these crazy files. I'm going to get MV all the things to the top level directory. Get RMR, the salt directory, uh, because the salt directory doesn't exist in Git anymore, because that's how that works. Git commit dash M. Well, uh, move to top level. Author. Oompa and compa at opensusa.org. And we'll do a dash S just for the funsies. And it does not name email and does not match. Oh, because I forgot the funny quote thingy at the end. There we go. And then it's going to make that commit. And that is, I am moving a shitload of files. That's probably uh, going to not be fun no matter what with Git. Uh, do it. Or are you going to just clean, be, hold this for a second? Bloody demos. All right, git config global user email in gumpetopensusa.org. Git config. I can't believe I'm doing this now. Shame on me for not trying this part first. Now I can do this. There we go. And then git push. Actually, we're just going to do a fun thing. Just gitify bash, push, push this here, v, push that here, and that is pushed. I can create a merge pull request right here, and we see here open PR, uh, and I can do this against, normally I could do this against like a fork or whatever, but since I just did it within this repo, there's a thing, create the pull request. You can see I changed uh, 21 files here, moved to top level. You can see I renamed all these things. There's no diff here. So it's got smart diff recognition for renaming. And then uh, delete branch after merging and merge. Confirm merge. Ah, uh, yes, the, getter, the, the worker should be running. Otherwise, very bad things would be happening right now. Oh, very bad things might be happening right now. Uh, journal. Hold on. Okay. Uh, a few bagger worker. And because of that, pseudo. Grabbing lock for one. It is doing stuff, right? Task is running. Yep, there we go. So it's starting to do stuff on the uh, inside. You can see it's doing get things. And is it still like trying to do the merge? No, it's done. There we go. Woo. Move to the top level, top commit. Branch went away. Nope, it's still trying to delete the branch. But there we go. And you see here on the top level, all the files are here. Read me about SUSE. Did funny this index highlighting. But spec is all here. And the pull request is done. Yep. So there we go. That's uh, the kind of the basics of what the, the Packer interface stuff looks like. Didn't go quite as perfectly as I hoped, but I think it went OK. So. Um, and you'll get the very important question, or I mean the very important slide now. Wait. And the very important slide that says thank you for your attention and if you have any questions. And I see one on the back there. Hi, thanks for the presentation. So my question is, does Pagger support um, PGP key signed commits? 
So the question is, does uh, Pagios support GPG sign commits? Uh, so as a Git repo, it supports GPG sign commits. Uh, it does not currently show them in the UI nor validates that the commits belong to the user. Uh, so the, you can't associate a user with a, you could via the email address, I guess. Um, it does not show that in the UI, but the backend does support it like any other Git repos. Would this be a good feature request? There is already a ticket on that. <laughs> Another question coming. How do you store the binaries? So you have a spec file and patches, but usually you also have tarballs and, and binary files. How do you store them? Um, so the question is, how do we store the binaries on the federal disk git, I guess? Is so is there a git integrated solution for that? I mean, um, I'm, in the, I'm from the OpenSUSE world, so I have no clue how we do that. So in Fedora, we split in uh, two different locations the tarballs from the spec files. The spec file are on, on Git repos, and tarballs are on the local side cache uh, on the side of it. And our build system pulls the, the spec files, which also contains the file sources, which includes the checksum of the tarballs, and retrieve, using that checksum, retrieve the corresponding tarball from the local side cache. So if I'm if I want to do a code hosting scenario using Pago, what are the key gaps slash differences between Pago and, let's say, GitLab? Um, what, are the, what are the key differences between Pago and GitLab? Um, my take will be um, it's going to depend on what your te the technology stack that you're currently using. If your team is familiar and well-versed in Ruby and knows how to maintain GitLab instances, then you know, I, would I would probably rely on GitLab. If your team is a Python shop or has not, doesn't have ex much experience with running uh, Ruby instances, Pagger is probably then an interesting uh, project to look into. A little bit of this, like the other thing is if you're running more constrained environments, like one of the one of the things that finally pushed me into starting to look at Vagger more was that I could no longer run GitLab comfortably on my tiny cloud VPSs or on my on my little crappy ARM servers that I have at home. And so with more constrained environments or more flexible environments, Vagger is a lot easier to roll out and manage. Um, and it's easier to plug into other infrastructure if you really want to because of the way that the architecture is set up, whereas GitLab is a very, very large monolithic Ruby on Rails thing with weird hybrid things all over the place. Um, so at least it, if, you, if you don't need all of the fanciness that GitLab has and if you want to have a somewhat smoother and easier experience maintaining your Git server um, and you've already got like maybe and you have some level of Python experience for like maybe if you want to extend things a little bit, Packer is a lot nicer of a choice than a lot of the other alternatives. So it's production ready then? I mean, we're running it all over the place. I mean, I personally have two private Packer instances, one that runs on Fedora and one that runs on OpenSUSE, uh, and mainly because the OpenSUSE one runs on Python 3. Woo. Um, but. Uh, uh, at, in the Fedora project, we've got several of them. I think I, we have two production ones, two staging ones, and then CentOS has two uh, has a production and a staging. And we have one in the cloud that's not really Yeah, and then we have a thingy that floats around doing stuff. Um, there's a few. Um, I know of a few public independent instances that exist. Um, you can kind of find them if you know how to Google for them. Uh, there's also um, a few people that are using it for in their internal corporate um, Pagger instances, and they've actually contributed fixes and improvements to us as well. So, like, the low barrier to entry to contributing and making the, the software better is actually, I think, a huge plus point for a lot of people. And um, just a side note on the, on the resource constraint, um, I actually managed to get Pagger running on a banana pie. Uh, I'm not saying it was fast. I'm mm -hmm. not saying you want to run the Linux kernel tree in that Pagger instance, but it did work. 
So two more questions. First of all, when it comes to using it internally, um, has your Red Hat product team ever thought about integrating it into you know, the OpenShift story or so? Or are they on a completely different track with their technology stack? And the second one on the CI, do you already have any direction like is there an existing CI project you would want to integrate or are you going to build this from scratch? Are there any ideas about that one? Um, so there are two questions here. Is uh, from a pro product perspective, as Rails considered uh, Pagger to become uh, something to product, uh, to productize, I'm not actually able to answer that question. I don't think it has been considered as such. Um, it is uh, run internally, uh, and I can also say the internal instance is running in OpenShift. Uh, that's, uh, that's how we know it does run in OpenShift. And the second question is about uh, the Pagger CI. So we currently support Jenkins, and you can point Pagger to any Jenkins instance that Pagger can access. Um, the Jenkins we mostly use is the one that is hosted by the ci.centos.org forks, just because the Centos forks are you know, next door neighbor, and we can actually easily poke them and see how it does. Uh, we would like to integrate with more CI system. The question has been, you know, so far, ci.centos has been answering our needs, uh, so it's, it puts less pressure on integrating with others. The architecture used is extensible, so we should be able to integrate with other CI system. Uh, we, are not, we haven't managed to, to actually get this uh, done yet. So at least from the, with the Packer CI stuff, with, uh, with the Jenkins, like the way that the uh, Packer CI is set up, when you set up a project and turn on the feature, you tell it what Jenkins instance you'd like to configure it with. So like, for example, if somebody had a project on Packer IO, they could easily, and uh, that was focused mainly on SUSE things, they could point it at ci.opensuse.org. And if they have the authentication set up to be able to do it, it can actually run CI jobs there, track the statuses, report back, and do those kinds of things. We have been looking at a number of uh, other kinds of CI systems to like explore for improving to get Travis CI or GitLab CI-like quality of ease of use for managing CI. It's just uh, difficult because the space is very uh, um, confusing, is to put it mildly. Insofar as like plugging it in with stuff like OpenShift, um, one of the things that I've been doing um, because of you know the stuff that I run is like I'd like to plug with the, the build release pipeline that's included in OpenShift with Pagger, and part of that is where we've been working on beefing up the notifications and the webhook stuff so that stuff works a little bit better. Uh, there's already a um, a project that was written by um, one of the uh, one of the Pagger contributors that actually bridges the gap already in a slightly different way, um, but I'd like to have more direct support for being able to integrate with more systems. Um, for these kinds of things, and that's kind of like where part of my focus has been recently for these kinds of things. Um, does it have a Helm chart? Does it run on Kubernetes? We don't have an official Helm chart for it because uh, I know that one exists because one of the externally run private uh, instances of Packer is run into Kubernetes, but nobody has stepped up to contribute a proper Helm chart to us. We would love to have one. Yep. Uh, it's just nobody has given one to us. Thanks. I think that's the end of the question, so thank you all for your attention and uh, have a good afternoon.